All right, cool. This is the August 25th uh, engineering productivity team office hours. Still the 24th for me, so I was a little caught off guard by that. <laughs> um, we're gonna start off talking about the eliminating usages of GitLab.com issue um, that we've been kind of going around. And um, I kind of wanted to start off asking um, a question that might help with prioritization on this. Because uh, there's a lot of discussion and proposals in the issue, um, but I was curious what you all what you all were thinking on this. If um, if we would need to do this as a requirement for Project Horse, um, so like I made some notes as to what that code name is in the doc. If you're not familiar with it, um, because I think we may the way that the current method works, it may not behave correctly in those environments. Um, that are being considered for that project. Do you all know? And if not, I'm happy to find um, the answer with just more. Chances are it probably will sometimes work and sometimes not work. So yeah. as we found out for um, GitLab JH, most of the time it works, but you're going to get caught out in like really tiny uh, trip wires. Yeah. And, and, and the biggest concern is that it's just unmaintainable. Yeah. yeah. And it's growing, right? So I think you have the script that looks at how it's grown each, each release and comparing it to master. So that's where I, I think Yeah, we can... yeah. So... Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just share my screen. Um, not that one. This one. Share my screen. So it, we started off like in 13 not oh, which is a long time away from at 76. Now it's 196. So I think we, we're at a time where I think we need to start stopping we need to stop new ones from coming in because we're at the 200 mark and this was at 13.12 right so and if i like it's very slow growth but the worrying thing is that if i kind of run the most recent one which is 14.3 we start to see like this 5716 here which is all gilab.jh and we're starting to grow that as well so mm -hmm. this is kind of like essentially it's adding one additional dimension to it, right? Because so far we've been dealing with gilab.com only, it's only a binary thing. Now when we add gilab, with gilab.gh growing as well, it's essentially uh, sort of a two 3D dimension now. So it's like two times three permutations. So self-managed gilab.com and gilab.gh. Uh, and not necessarily all tested. And you can see how that becomes a problem if we keep growing at this way. So that's why I think we, this is, now or sometime soon is, is a good time to start uh, the, to start banning new ones as I say as a start. Mm -hmm. sure and and it seems like the place to start is just with the, the gitlab.com method, um, trying to I'll say like cordon off that, those and uh, prevent new ones from coming in, right? Um, or do you think or do you think it just we just need to do something for all of them initially it, it's not it's not that hard to extend it to all the methods um because <laughs> strangely we're gila.com and gila.com or def and then you know there's sort of variants right so mm -hmm. it's not that hard to just say okay this methods uh ban it okay uh using google mm -hmm. should be all right uh, someone can correct me um and then I put a note in the doc as well and to make things even clearer, we can move this methods to a different module and then just say this whole module don't use it. Uh, yeah. ah. uh, specifically, I'm taking the GitLab SAS module. So we can move all those uh, methods, GitLab.com, GitLab.com, or dev, and GitLab.jh all to this GitLab SAS module and then say, yeah, we don't use it. And of course, they're, they're caveats, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So, so the next question would be is what, um, so I think we talk about application setting 
I think it was application settings or trying to get the information from other sources. Um, would we, um, I, I mean, I, I'm sure it would take just someone to identify those, but is there a known, like a known path to migrate are the biggest offenders, like the ones you just talked about? Yeah, basically application settings. So um, the clearest example that we have already currently is the uh, check namespace planes uh, application setting, which uh, is a very good example, right? That could have been a you get a .com check, but we have an application setting to, to turn it on and then um, do it that way. Uh, so a lot, a lot of things could be moved to application settings. Um, the only thing is that um, we can't, then we, we just have to do on, on a case by case basis, um, whether it's a different thing or whether it's just application setting, but it will not never make any sense for someone that's not assess uh, instance to turn on. So for example, uh, features that deal with uh, billing and so on and so forth, that we, we know that <laughs> you're connecting to nothing. So, so how does that improve the maintainability? Um, sorry if this, this is like a silly question. It seems like we'd saw the same permutations uh, from like a test and validation perspective if we move to something new from what we currently have. It just may slow the growth. So basically, um, it just means that anyone can turn on that, that application setting or development or their testing thing. Uh, and run tests against them, basically. If we hard code things like if um, you can't test it unless you make it all the way to gitlab.com. And then this is how we end up with uh, hacks on top of hacks, where we say if gitlab.com or some other testing environment, which we pretend to be gitlab.com, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can see the issue where uh, now we want a different test environment, but slightly different settings. <laughs> then, then we need to add more hacks on top of it. And then we, we eventually will end up with an if else statement where it's like if gila.com, else if something some other says, else if some other says. We, we definitely do not want that. So, so we need to understand like what kind of, what does gila.com actually represents in terms of application settings and then um, abstract that, like represent what we currently call gila.com based on the settings that we have, like or, or a combination of different settings that we have, or a new setting that if we need any, and use that instead of a hard coded post name like gitlab.com or gitlabjh or something else. Correct. So, correct. Like, right now, like, do we know how many? What are these representations? That do we already have them, or do we need to investigate and like list down like all of the current users of gitlab.com what they are? What do they rep represent? Um, I think it's definitely not something that uh, the engineering productivity group uh, or anyone else should be looking into. Mm. Uh, what what this group should be looking into is just kind of setting the line in the sand to say you know the, and writing code to to ban it and and to allow exceptions for it. Mm -hmm. And the opening issue is to say okay, um, this is a problem, um, and then explaining why this is a problem. And then asking them to, well, and then saying, and maybe application settings is a very common way of migrating across. What application, what current application settings do you think we can use, or what new application settings that that you need to create in order to migrate this across? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So it's it's fanning out issues to to the groups that are using mm -hmm. these uh, calls. So we. So we start by stop uh, preventing new occurrences of this, and then when when this when someone introduces this, then we, we can ask them, um, can you think about a different way of representing this? And in the application settings, um, use data that we have in the application setting to determine this condition. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Or add a new one if there isn't any. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that instantly solves the mm-hmm. and that that that's uh that solves the maintainability problem now. So everything yeah. now becomes it is an application sending on off versus yes. if else if else if else. Um, yeah, this, this, this. Um, and then I think this is where we like uh, the person kind of driving this is a DRI potentially could partner with the growth team or the adoption team. I don't know who, because that's probably the biggest uh, issue is like, do we want a stronger guarantee than application settings, for example? Um, I'm speaking in a sense like a cri- cryptographic guarantee. Uh, for places where we really, really want only Git.com to to use this thing or whatever this fence is. And the license is, is one example, right? Where we mm. specifically say only people with this license can access GitLab EE features, for example. Mm. Now, do we want something similar for Git.com mm. and only for Git.com or not? And that's going to be... And then maybe we want to extend it to other SaaS instances or not. So we, but we want that option potentially. So I'm thinking like the customer's uh, licensing portal, for example. Okay. So, um, so, so uh, what I'm hearing here is um, EP or, you know, the person who's the the team who's picking this up would be the DRA to drive it forward, um, but if and and if I'm talking about the benefits here, I'm still disconnecting like maintainability and testability because it sounds like it's getting like exponentially more complex to validate um, features that would be that would have like these multiple layers now of things that could toggle them on and off in a test environment whether that's staging debt, like wherever, it could be an ephemeral test environment. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I wouldn't say it's yeah. exponential, but it is, there is some like permutation of X. Yeah, it's more, at least multiplication. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Exponential is maybe too strong because uh, we wouldn't say there's one application setting for everything, but I'm just kind of seeing we, we'd have this interlay of feature flag application mm-hmm. settings that would need to be confirmed um, especially with end-to-end tests, but maybe even lower level tests in, yes. in test environments. Yes, that's right. Say that, yeah. but the difference, the key difference is that now it's, we can control it like, through, because we know what the input is right now and we can control that as opposed to using a URL, which we don't have uh, control at all in terms of, like from a testing perspective, we can't change that input. Yeah, I see here. Okay. Okay. Um, so if we were to start somewhere small, uh, so like we talked about having the cop and then starting to work with teams to migrate, are there maybe some good offenders that, and I'll admit, I haven't looked like I know, I know where they're being used, um, I, but I, I don't know where maybe a good place to start and try this out might be. Um, do either of you have an idea? Like if we were to just say, let's pick this feature or this usage of gitlab.com to try out migrating it to application settings and look at the complexity, what would be a good place to start? Um, there's 200 instances of GitHub.com, so <laughs> we can pick any one of that. You probably want to avoid migrations a little, a little bit, um, but other than that, like any any is fine. Yeah. Okay. So so nothing special to look for. Just pick one. Mm. Okay. Um, Maybe something I mean, with migrations. The first one is to stop new ones, and and, and then from there, you totally. can just pick any. Yeah. Yeah. Just pick any, and then I'm sure once you pick one or two, you. Uh, we can figure out. Oh, okay, there's a common pattern here, and then just then you might have a better sense about oh, which is a better place to start. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think um, um 
I can't remember his name, sorry. <laughs> I remember his username. I think God has, has a good sense of, might, might have a good sense of where to start. Uh, sorry, I don't even remember him by yeah, his Jin username. Jin Shen. Jin Shen, that's right. That's okay, we know. Yeah, <laughs> I such yeah. a member of username, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he'll probably have a good um, sense as well because he's working with uh, JH as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess my reason for that question is I'm I I'm really hesitant to draw that line in the sand with that chat like that challenge that I see of application setting and permutation um, like the permutations caused by this for testability I totally understand that this needs to be better I'll say we need to stop so that as we um, so we can have more consistent behavior. But it feels like we're trading, like we're creating a bigger problem than what we have. Convince me that I'm wrong. Like, why? Why is the the new state of application setting better than the current state? Uh, I think it's it's a very easy two way decision right now. So if you write a cop and ban it, and we discover it doesn't work, and we just stop the cop, right? Okay. So I think there's definitely a bad time, but to kind of illustrate um, why it's really, really bad. Uh, I mean, now is a good time before it gets even, even, even worse. So uh, let me kind of, kind of illustrate what's going on. I'll write some quick code to show you what's, what's the problem here. So the issue is that if we kind of write code like this, right? And then say, do something else, maybe, Manage. So this is why we started our ad. Now, once we have something like uh, the, the other project or something, maybe, maybe there is a world where we can just say, do this, so just copy everything over. So this is okay, -ish, right? But already we are saying that uh we require something a little bit more complex in a lot of places uh, not not uh, not super a lot but already we're seeing that where uh we kind of require something like this oh, can't spell. but like where it's dev like dev or staging or jh probably jh more often than not Right. Yeah. So yeah. already we're sending something like this. And then to put it even worse is that this code, if you have this on the um, controller, you're going to have to replicate the same thing in, in um, the view as well. So it's like very contagious technique of that. So whenever you do something like that, chances are you set some, some kind of um, special thing that's only uh, in instant build, but it's only available in that. And then now you have to do something, the same case statement in views as well. So like it gets worse and worse. So mm -hmm. some people will say, oh, use the case statement, but that, that's, just a, that's just a reformulation of the if else statement. So, and then contrast that with what the application settings does or, or some other thing, right? we just go feature, uh, wait, application setting is uh, like current settings. So. Uh, I can't remember what the thing is. Feature available, I think, is what it is called. You're getting wrong, but, but you get my truth. Right? Yeah, yeah, I, I get the general idea. Call some method with whatever the setting is. Yeah, whatever the, the thing is, right? And then else, like it's that, like, and you never, you never have to change it, right? So. So you know. And then this this can be turned on or off. Like different different things can turn on off. Now the complexity becomes here. Uh, you have to kind of ensure that for something on gila.com, if you really want to turn this on, you write a migration, some script to, to automatically turn this on. So sort of thing. So yes, there is some cost. There a trade off where you have to manage the set of things that are turned on from gila.com. But it's far better to manage that on a data level than having to manage that on code. Um, so this, this is what I mean, that makes sense. 
think uh, to link back to the horse project. So imagine like if we have a horse project which requires multiple deployments and some of this requires similar features to like gitlab.com and some don't, um, mm -hmm. then we need like going by the old way, we would need like individual of these branches added in, but by extracting that to a setting, application setting or something like that, that is abstract, um, we can have like each individual instances of the horse um, implement the same um, configuration and then that will provide them with the same set of features. Right. And it's unlikely that what's being done for Jihu is done for that too. Because like what I can see when I was thinking about this a little bit more closely, I, I see the potential of um, Project Horse taking off and needing a similar, like slightly different flavor of some of this logic uh, in some, some instances. Maybe I'm completely wrong here, but I don't think it would necessarily work for GitLab.com and our current um, logic wouldn't wouldn't cover it. Um, so, so that was one thing that came to mind that I think could really uh, reinforce maybe the urgency a bit more to some uh, to other stakeholders who maybe aren't necessarily working in the code as much. Right? Um, I know there's a big focus on technical debt right now too. I'm just trying to think how we can make the case to prioritize this a little bit better. Um, and really I'll say like, understand that testability aspect, um, where, um, when, when we are on different environments, how do we ensure that that state is what we want to try to validate against? Okay. I would say we already are hitting problems with, uh, JH already. So. <laughs> that should require a big um, priority set, I feel. Right. And that would be where maybe uh, where Jin Shin could, could provide some ideas on, because I, um, so it's like if the feature, like if the application setting is on, do something for the feature. Um, even in JH, if they're doing something slightly different with that feature, what would they do in that situation? Would they have a different application setting or would they have another branch in that, in that method chain is what I would, I'm trying to understand. Like if we're just gonna shift the complexity to a new model and it's still gonna be the same amount of complexity or if it will really actually be simpler. Uh, and I'm sorry that I'm being dense here. Like this is probably super clear to you <laughs> and it's, it's just not landing oh, no, with me yet. I've been I've been kind of like thinking about this for a year now, so I got I got a bit of a head start. Um, I understand your yeah, apprehension about shifting the complexity to a downtime model, but um, I've been through this like twice now in in different projects, not not GitLab, but you know previous roles. Uh, a data based or a data based setting is always going to be better than randomly modifying code. For different code branches, always, always, especially when you have yeah, uh, end end times kind of like you know, we call that white labeling, but you know, like different instances is uh, is our parlance. Yeah. yeah, that that uh that pattern that fits with twelve factor app, right? That like this sort of behavior shouldn't be managed like like it, it should be managed somewhere that's. Yes, that's configuration, yeah. Yeah, configuration, that's what I was looking for. I don't know why that word escaped my brain. Could be that it's 10.30. <laughs> that's all right. And, and as Albert knows, my day started or I had five today too. Yeah, um, so, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My apologies, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think like the question for me is that uh, it seems like we don't know what the priority is and whether we want to start now or later. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Because I'm just curious. Uh, it's somewhere I know our own quality, but I don't know whether you agree with that, with that or not. So I, I would say my stance is that quality should be the people to draw the line and help equip teams to, to do it, the, the model that you pretty much talked about. It could be EP, it could be um, 
I think it belongs more with EP than SETs. Um, but prioritizing it alongside everything else right now, like rapid actions and well, not rapid action, engineering allocations um, and other things, I, I believe would be a challenge for teams, which is why I'm trying to have a crystal clear, concise value statement that I could relate to start to at least relate to the other quality managers to say, this is something we need to consider much higher than what we are right now. Mm, I see, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Albert, I'm curious what your take is on this. Like there's not really, to me, I don't see a team in development or another department that would steer these kind of efforts. Um, yeah, I think in terms of drawing that setting, drawing up that line and um, setting up, helping other teams um, make the migration will be sort of relevant to EP, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, like actual changes, like eventually, um, will still need to be done indiv by individual teams who maintain the features. I think what we can do is provide the tools and guidelines on how, like, what are the things that we can that people can consider um, in, as an alternative to the gilab.com question mark. Yeah. Um, so, 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 Tong, I'll, I'll probably, um, like, one, I want to read through the issue a bit more, try to be a little bit more direct about um, the problem that the technical debt is creating so that we can look at the prioritization of this alongside, um, I'll say, reliability support efforts that EP is involved in, um, as well as the rest of the quality department. Um, it is just a challenging thing to just put somebody on right now. But I also see this runaway train. Like, um, if, if we don't have a good way of equipping teams, it's a hard thing to, um, I don't know. Um, it's something that we need to think on a bit more for priority and urgency. Mm. Have have a read at the issue. I actually try to list out like why it is why is this problem um, and and what what alternatives we have. Like I try to make it as executive friendly as possible. So hopefully it's quite short. Uh, have have a read at that. And my final kind of point will be uh, it's probably better to start now if you can because there's only two hundred. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's only going to get worse. Like it's not going to get better. I, like, yes. That's, yeah, that, that, that's kind of what I meant with the runaway train analogy. Like where it's not going to fix itself. And when it's time to fix it, it's only going to be harder. And yeah, look at it now, but it looks like it's exponentially growing. Like I think all the thin one is like five per release and now it's about 20. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I I, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that's it on this. Um, I, I appreciate both of you joining. Um, Albert, if this is something that you're passionate about picking up, like maybe let's let's chat about it more next week on how we can refine this. Um, like like I kind of alluded to today, I, we're really going to look towards some small iterations of review app enhancements to really equip the create stage um, with review apps that are fit for their purpose to do. Um, validation for the definition of done changes. Uh, so that'll be an epic that I'm putting together tomorrow. Okay. Um, so, okay. That's the only thing on the agenda and we're the only people here. So if this is all, uh, I say we call it and I'll post this in the morning for me. Okay. Thank you for joining, and I appreciate the discussion on this. Y'all have a good rest of your day. Okay. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Have See a good you. evening. Bye -bye. Good day. Bye. -bye.